So here we can recap two ter hormones again. So this would be the hypothalamus here, and this would be the posterior two ter. And this vessel here would be the inferior hypophyseal artery, which was the branch of the internal carotid artery, the cavernous portion. The two hormones that would be produced was oxytocin and ADH. ADH was important for water reabsorption in the collecting tubules of the kidney. And oxytocin was important for uterine muscle contractions, so to facilitate labor, and mammary gland contractions, so to facilitate lactation. In the anterior pituitary gland, we had the portal circulation, which began by the superior hypophyseal artery that went to the median eminence. The releasing factors from the hypothalamus was released went through a portal vein, and then it went to the anterior pituitary gland, where we had two types of cells, acetophils and basophils. The acetophils was responsible for the production of growth hormone and prolactin, while the basophils produced TSH, ACTH, FSH, and LH. When we're talking about the portal circulation, it must be emphasized that it's not exclusive to the hypothalamus or the pituitary gland by any means, we have it in different places around the body. Another good example would be the portal circulation found in the liver. Now let's talk in detail about what these hormones actually do. The growth hormone was produced in the anterior pituitary gland and it was produced by acetophils, the subgroup of which was the somatotrophs. It was stimulated by growth hormone releasing hormone, which was produced in the arcuate nuclei and was inhibited by growth hormone inhibiting hormone, also known as somatostatin, which was produced in the paraventricular nuclei. Now the growth hormone, once released, goes to many different tissues. One would be the muscles, where it would increase protein synthesis. Another would be the liver, where you would have increased gluconeogenesis. Now this insulin-like growth factor, or somatomedines, would go from the liver, and it would go to different body tissues to facilitate growth. So growth hormone, as the name suggests, is important then for growth. The other hormone that we saw was also another hormone from the acetophils, but this time it was the lactotrophs. Now this one was the prolactin, which we see here. The prolactin was stimulated by prolactin releasing factor. This releasing factor was with another name, TRH, thyrotropin releasing hormone. This came off the paraventricular nuclei. It was inhibited by prolactin inhibiting factor, which with another name was dopamine, which came from the arcuate nuclei. Once produced, the prolactin would go to the mammary gland where it would lead to milk synthesis. Another thing it could do in males is that it goes to the testis and it stimulates testosterone production. Testosterone, as you knew, was the male sex hormone. Now let's go to our basophils. We had our tyrotrophs. Now the tyrotrophs, the thyroid stimulating hormone, was stimulated by tyrotropin releasing hormone, which was released from the paraventricular nuclei. It went through the thyroid gland, and there it would produce T3 and T4. These would be in a 20 to 1 ratio in the blood. So T4 would be 20 times as much in the blood as T3. And this is because T3 is 3 to 4 times as potent as T4. Now, what these hormones essentially do is that they will lead to cellular oxidation and growth. Essentially, what this means is that they will alter the basic metabolic rate in a positive way. Now, let's focus on our second group in the basophil category, our gonadotrophs. This was the follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. They were stimulated by the release of gonadotropic-releasing hormone, which was released from the sexual dimorphic nuclei in the medial preoptic nuclei in the preoptic region of the hypothalamus. And they were inhibited by the gonadotropic releasing factor, also known as somatostatin. And this was released from uh, the paraventricular nuclei. Now, FSH, once released in males, would go to the testes and essentially would lead to spermatogenesis. And in females, it would go to the ovary and lead to follicular development. And also the production of estradiol, which is the female sex hormone. LH, would, uh, the luteinizing hormone in males, would go to the testes and this will lead to the development of testosterone. And in female, it will lead to ov ovulation and also the production of progesterone in the corpus luteum. The last group on our list will be the corticotrophs, which was the third population of the in the basophil category. Now, ACTH will be stimulated by 
the corticotropic releasing hormone, which was released by the paraventricular nuclei in the hypothalamus. Now these corticotrophs produced ACTH, then the ACTH or adrenocortical hormone would go to adrenal cortex where it would produce glucocorticoids. Now these glucocorticoids would then produce, uh, would then stimulate sodium up uh, reuptake, uh, stress adaptation and protective effects. When we talk about glucocorticoids or corticosteroids, the emphasis should be on cortisol. Cortisol, as you know, had anti-inflammatory functions. This is by inhibiting uh, the productions of pro-inflammatory uh, pro-inflammatory proteins and uh, stimulating the production of anti-inflammatory proteins. Another function and the reason it got its name was its effects on glucose metabolism. So the cortisol, what, what it would do is that it would go to the liver and induce glycogenolysis, which essentially the breakdown of glycogen to glucose, so to increase the glucose levels. Another thing as well it would do was to go to the cells and induce gluconeogenesis, which is the production of glucose, so to increase the glucose levels in the blood. Other hormones that we see here that comes off the adrenocorticotropic hormone is gonna be the beta endorphin, which is an opioid, which is important for analgesia. Also, you would see alpha MSH here, which is essentially melatonin. Melatonin, you know, uh, will lead to pigmentation in the skin. Now let's focus on feedback regulation. Now the hypothalamus as we've seen produces releasing hormones. An example here would be the thyrotropic releasing hormones, which we know came off the pyroventricular nuclei. This would then go to the anterior pituitary gland, and then it would go to the thyrotrophs, which was a basophil. And then th from there, the thyrotroph would produce thyroid stimulating hormones, and, and that would in turn stimulate the production of T3 and T4. Remember, there's 20 times much more T4 in the blood than T3, but T3 is the very potent one. And this will lead to an increase in the basic metabolic rate. Now, if we have too much of this T3 and T4, that would then go to the pituitary gland to inhibit the releasement of TSH, and as well as the hypothalamus to inhibit the releasement of the TRH. This is known as a negative feedback. Why? Because we don't want the production of thyroxine anymore. We don't need it anymore. There's already too much of it in the blood. So that's why too much of it will then lead to a negative feedback. So we don't want the production. If on the other hand, we had too little of these hormones, that will lead to a positive feedback. So that would in turn lift inhibition from the hypothalamus to produce TRH and uh, TSH respectively from the pituitary gland to stimulate the thyroid gland to produce thyroxine. And that in turn would again alter the basic metabolic rate in a positive way. I want to thank you for paying attention and I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something and we'll continue our journey throughout the endocrine system. Organ we're going to talk about will be the thyroid gland. So we'll discuss a little bit about what the thyroid gland does. Although we mentioned the basic metabolic rate, we'll actually see how this works. So I hope to see you there. Thank you. Bye.